I'm Aaron David Miller, and this is Carnegie Connects. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this world of ours. I truly hope you're safe, sound, and healthy. I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and welcome to Carnegie Connects, a set of virtual conversations, at least for now, on issues of critical importance to America and to the world. Today, I'm truly pleased and honored to be able to host General James Clapper. General Clapper has had a extremely distinguished career uh, in the military and in the intelligence community, most recently serving as the Director of National Intelligence, uh, the fourth uh, uh, DNI, but the longest serving DNI uh, from uh, 2010 to 2017. Now, General Clapper, I wanna welcome you to Carnegie Connects. Thanks, Aaron, for having me. I'm particularly pleased to have General Clapper here uh, today because um, um, perhaps some the three or four most extraordinary years of my State Department career was at the, at the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the Department of State. And it was there that I, I developed a profound uh, appreciation for the role that effective intelligence plays in the formation of, um, <clears throat> of American foreign policy and uh, the importance of integrity, clarity, and honesty. Even though honest analysis often leads to paralysis in terms of um, options for very busy secretaries of states and presidents who want to do things to fix things in the world. If you don't pay attention to the way the world is, then you have not only very little chance of reshaping that world, but you're going to end up failing, sometimes catastrophically. So I want to, uh, General Clapper, divide our conversation into two parts. First, uh, I have a number of questions to ask you about the role of intelligence from your perspective in foreign policy. And then I, uh, I would be remiss if we didn't take advantage of your uh, extraordinary analytical capacity to comment on some of the um, uh, foreign policy challenges that are currently on the president's plate. So let me begin with a question on assessment. CNN reported, I, I think you know, in May uh, of this year that the uh, intelligence community, the IC, was undertaking a review, an internal review of its practices, procedures, and assessments in response to both Afghanistan and Ukraine. In, in the first, Afghanistan, critics fairly or unfairly charged that um, the intelligence um, uh, overestimated the capacity of the Afghan National Security Forces to resist what became a, a lightning Taliban takeover of most of the country in Kabul. And the latter on Ukraine, the knock was uh, from Congress and others that the intelligence community underestimated the capacity of the Ukrainian military to resist um, the Russian aggression, Russian invasion. Um, so I just wondered, I'd, I'd really like your take on, um, first of all, whether you think that's a fair critique, um, and second, um, the degree of difficulty that is involved, uh, you've been on the inside uh, on trying to assess intent uh, motivation, will, and capacity? Well, it's a very apt, apt and timely question. And I, I would observe first that we have never been able to uh, ga uh, accurately gauge will to fight. And that's what this really boils down to. If you go back to my war, Southeast Asia, I, I did a couple tours there. And we consistently uh, over uh, overestimated the will to fight of our client, the South Vietnamese, and profoundly underestimated the will to fight of the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. Fast forward to Afghanistan. Similarly, we uh, underestimated the will to fight of the Taliban and overestimated the will to fight of the Afghan government or the Afghan military and the viability of its government. And that's been a consistent pattern. And we did it again with Ukraine and uh, Russia. Why is that? Well, the reason it is, is because it is extremely hard to assess, particularly in advance, just how a military formation is going to perform, even whether at the individual soldier level or to add to the complexities of a unit, 
and the dynamics of a, of a unit fighting in combat. There's an old saw in intelligence about the difference between mysteries and secrets. Yeah. Secrets are knowable empirical facts. Mysteries are not. They're abstractions, they're unknowns. And I think too often, some, or sometimes at least, the uh, intelligence community is held to the same exacting standards for divining both mysteries and secrets. And so I've been engaged with the group that um, of Real Haynes, the current director of national intelligence, who's great and a good friend. She had me engaged with the group that's that's doing this work to try to come up with a, a more accurate gauge or a more accurate way of, of forecasting will to fight. And they're not having a lot of success. I mean, if we could have figured this out we would have done this years ago, but in the 50 or 60 years that I've been in the Intel game, that has always been a difficult problem. So when we're, when the intelligence community, in my view, when the intelligence community is asked to make assessments like this, it should heavily caveat uh, uh, what it's saying. There are certain characteristics and attributes of opposing militaries that you can describe but at the, the bottom line should be when combat is joined, all bets are off. Right. It, it, to paraphrase Mike Tyson, you know, it, you know, it, it's all good until you get punched in the mouth, and then basically you need to, you need to basically readjust, which is, occurs on all kinds of issues uh, right. of marginal and extremely important significance. Um, but why, the pitfall, why, if I, Aaron, if I could, just yeah, the sure. pitfall here is when the intelligence community is pressured into making uh, pronouncements like this, it ought to be very cautious, very wary of uh, misrepresenting uh, uh, what's gonna happen because it just, my experience has been, we have been singularly unsuccessful at predicting accurately and consistently will to fight. I mean, collecting information on what you can't see, which is will to fight, um, cultural and personal right. motivations is a lot harder than collecting information on things you can see uh, an, an order of battle, art, artillery and tanks. But I guess it cuts to the question of why, why don't we, it's hard, figuring out what the other guy is doing is hard always, but what are some of the elements that do you think that explain why we are weak in this in this particular deficit? Well, one part of the problem is we have we uh, uh, we often suffer a case of clientitis. I was just going to so, say uh, I'll I'll take a war that's you know historical Vietnam, right? And I think our military uh, you know gets invested in the mission. And you get, assign a, mil, a senior military officer a, a, a military mission, particularly a combat military mission involving risk to the lives of, of troops, uh, they're going to err on the side of optimism. Um, and that, that, that's been a consistent trait. It, it, it's not bad. I, I don't mean that pejoratively, but it's just a fact. It was that way in Vietnam my war, and it certainly was that way in Afghanistan, the, the, the succession of four stars that served in Afghan, U.S. four stars that served out there as, as the senior military officer, they were all the same way. Uh, they all had a degree of optimism about the, the, project, of, of the outcome of, of, of the combat. And it is understandable, but it's something that, you know, it's have to, you have to recognize that. I once got chastised by then Senator, uh, chairman of the, then chairman of the Senate Armed Service Committee, Carl Levin, um, rest his soul, um, about why that's so. Why is it the intelligence community is invariably so pessimistic about, and he was speaking specifically of Afghanistan and, wh and why the military has a different view. And I said, well, we are the uh, glass is half, half empty crowd and the military is the glass is half full crowd. And I guess perhaps the truth is somewhere around the waterline. Well, now that you mention it, you know, it, 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 
it strikes me that it, maybe the right conceit is the glass that is filling crowd. That you sure. basically have to assess uh, the pros and the cons, the ups and the downs, and and perpetually, continuously reassess in order to account for all sorts of changes. Exactly, and then, Aaron. And what what makes it difficult is it's very hard to subtract, if you will, the impact of the U.S. military presence. Mm -hmm. we, we don't even have to be invade and engage in active aggressive combat. Just the fact that we're, we were present, well, that has a bearing on will to fight. And it, it's, it's hard to factor that in. And certainly, and it's, it was difficult for the, our, our own military to factor the, the, just the, uh, the effect of our simple presence in Afghanistan. And, and as we saw, as soon as we left, uh, what happened? And, uh, and uh, I think sometimes we, we overlook or under, uh, undervalue the, the impact of our, our simple presence. Right. Um, w let me ask you, we, we, we've hinted, and I, I, I can't imagine that, uh, that Ukraine was any, anything that even remotely resembles, despite criticism from Congress that the IC, the intelligence community, underestimated the Ukrainian will to fight. I'm not sure, had those uh, estimates been more consistent, how our policy toward Ukraine would have changed in a run-up to the uh, Russian invasion. But it would seem to me that Ukraine was an example, frankly, in the wake of Afghanistan, Iraq, um, inaccurate assessments on Iran, Vietnam, where the intelligence community actually shined and shined big time in, in two respects. Number one, the whole question of strategic warning. Um, and second, the use of intelligence to dominate the information space. Um, I, I just wonder if you could comment on, on both of those, particularly the second, because it seemed to me that was governments use intelligence all the time uh, in pursuit and um, in furtherance of policies. But the domination of the information space seemed to be rather extraordinary and very successful. Aaron, I think the best way for me to respond to that is to contrast the the latest Russian invasion of Ukraine with 2014, when I was then a director of national intelligence. And there, are, I think there's some contrasts there that uh, I think might cast some light on the, on the questions you're raising. In 2014, of course, the Russians were a lot more subtle about their uh, entree into U Eastern Ukraine and, and Crimea you know, the little green man, no insignia, and all that kind of thing. Uh, well, this time the Russians were about as subtle as a freight train. And it was quite obvious uh, to the casual observer, given the proliferation and the high resolution now available of commercial imagery, yeah. where everybody can see the Russian formations there. It was, it was, all, it was there, to, you know, uh, hits you like a ball bat. Secondly, is the performance of the Ukrainians in 2014 was not the greatest. They didn't put up a lot of resistance. Well, eight years elapsed, and uh, after the, the, the given the benefit of the training that the both the U.S. and NATO provided, I think we saw the impacts of that on the Ukrainian military was able to operate on small units uh, with a lot more decision-making at lower levels, much like our military operates, and not in the, uh, you know, the old Soviet model, which is kind of the, the legacy of early Ukrainian military thought. And the other thing, of course, is the impact of technology itself, as I alluded. Well, a lot more... Uh, high resolution commercial imagery, unclassified, that everybody can see this time that we did not have benefit of in 2014. And the last factor I'll mention is the realization by the United States that we also have to play in the information space hmm. and, and to be a lot more aggressive 
than we certainly were in 2014, where frankly, we were more passive, more, much more conservative about the use of intelligence. I'm in part to blame for that. So I think the answers to your question, I think are best seen in the context of what happened 2014 versus recently. In your experience though, working or even when you weren't uh, in, in the IC or DNI, is this more or less a first in terms of the deployment of this intelligence? I mean, after all, it wasn't meant to deter, presumably. It was meant to dominate the information space, marshal allied support, um, perhaps catch the Russians off balance with some of the assessments. But had you ever seen anything like this before? Not, not on this scale, no. And, and I'm all for it. I, I think uh, the more... Uh, I mean, I think, really, you need to think of uh, intelligence as, a, as another weapon system. You know, we, we provided stingers and javelins and HIMARS and all this equipment to the Ukrainians to, to uh, do bad things to the Russians. Well, the, the same is true of intelligence. Now, and, and particularly when you, go, when you go public, when you dime out false flag operations or when you predict and, hope, and fortunately, it was correct that the Russians are going to invade, which has it has great impact from a public diplomacy standpoint. All of that is good stuff, and it's good to do. The downside, of course, is what intelligence people traditionally worry about, which you certainly understand, is the protection of sources and methods and tradecraft. Uh, you know, because the first thing the Russians would it's typically do is kind of back engineer some revelation based public revelation based on intelligence yeah. and say, well, how did they get that? <laughs> uh, so that's, that's the upside and downside. But having said all that, I'm all for the use of intelligence in, in a, in a public way like this, because I think it had great impact. Right. Um, when you were in, uh, at, at DNI, you, you believe deeply. Uh, I read a few interviews and, and talks you gave on the whole notion of integration, of bringing human, human intelligence, SIGINT, signal intelligence, and I guess geo, ge, geo ints, right? geospatial intelligence. And I think you had a great line. I think you said everybody, everybody or everything has to be somewhere. So the notion of geospatial intelligence is a fascinating one. I mean, in you know, in, in my career it was human and it was human and SIGINT, but um, human is clearly the rarest and most difficult challenge that any intelligence um, service confronts. In a, in an environment in which there appears to be more transparency than ever before. You referred a couple of times to commercial imagery, which is pretty extraordinary. With AI, with digital and facial recognition, is the traditional tradecraft, I think one of the talks you gave, you you didn't like the word, the SPY word, but is, is spine traditionally framed in the movies and on television and in, in the collection of intelligence harder even though it is continues to be as useful or or not. Well, first a brief word on um, uh, integration, uh, which gets at the very root or the very purpose of why the position of the Director of National Intelligence was established in the first place. And integration, coordination, collaboration, whatever term you want to use like that, is not a natural bureaucratic act. <laughs> And in the absence of a champion whose full-time job is to push integration, it won't happen. So I, I do want to make, you know, get that off my chest. Right. With specific, specific respect to human, which, by the way, is, is, is just as critical, maybe more so than it ever has been. But I think there's a metamorphosis occurring in, in the practice of human that's going to change change the way it's it's been done everybody establishes an electronic footprint very early in life to include future employees of cia hmm. 
So when you become an employee, uh, the notion of going undercover or having uh, an, an alias uh, or, or multiple aliases is increasingly anachronistic because of the technology as you alluded. An age of biometrics, facial recognition, retinal recognition, et cetera, is going to change the nature of the way human is conducted such that people are going to have to live their true identities and mask their official connection. And I think over time it's going to make operating out of an embassy virtually impossible. Uh, it's difficult now, particularly in uh, denied area states such as Russia or China. So, but the need for human intelligence is, is, is going to be, is always going to be there. And of course, now recruiting and acquisition of information can take place virtually, which poses its, its own set of challenges, by the way. So it, 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 it's, it can be practiced as it has been, but I think in much, the techniques are going, and tactics are going to be much different. I mean, we've had experience in dealing with authoritarian regimes and leaders whose decision-making style is not transparent at all and whose security services are um, quite, quite effective. So in a case like Vladimir Putin, the assessing Putin's intentions, his motivations, the Russians assembled, I mean, Bill Burns was in, was in, uh, was traveling in the fall of 2021, um, including uh, a trip to Moscow, there was evidence that the Russians were um, mobilizing and planning. Um, they kept nearly 120, 30,000 forces deployed over a period of weeks, which was, or longer, which I think was unique. Uh, when was the last time any world leader uh, poised uh, their forces uh, in an effort to attack a sovereign country and then attacked, um, maybe Saddam Hussein in 91. But how do you even begin to um, process um, collecting intelligence uh, when the, 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 the target is so withholding and difficult to to read. How do you, how do you well? Begin to... This this is a the question you raise uh, points up the, the contrast between um, capabilities and intentions. And traditionally, classically, the intelligence community does a pretty good job of assessing capabilities. You know, how much equipment and uh, the technical characteristics of the equipment. Uh, we're we're really good at that. Now intentions is that's a different that's a different kettle of fish because what you're doing then is trying to assess what's going on in someone's mind, and particularly uh, in uh, autocrat autocracies like Russia, China, North Korea, where it's the mind of one man, um, and that that is a difficult by any stretch. Uh, a task. In Putin's case, it was really hard because of his isolation mm. um, bureaucratically for 20 years and his, his, his physical uh, isolation uh, over the course of the pandemic. You know, the, you know, the vision of the long table and people at, at the way distant end, that uh, right. sort of thing. Um, so that, that isolation and the few number of people that really have access and influ influence makes the the problem for our intelligence committee very tough. There's just no question about it. So you end up as kind of an armchair psychoanalyst and uh, trying to f impute what uh, Putin's motives and what his history has been and you now, how his upbringing uh, affected affects his decision making, and you know things like that, which is uh, you know pretty subjective, really. Right. Um, before we turn to uh, 
the current hotspots, North Korea, Iran, Russia, and Ukraine. Uh, I want to ask you a question about um, the politics of intelligence. You know, good analysis doesn't sell itself. And at the highest levels of our government, decision makers are human. They have their own personal biases and predispositions. Presidents come into office with or without foreign policy experience in case where they have it. They, they may have entrenched views of, of how a problem should be resolved. So you have a problem. My, my colleague at Carnegie, Chris Shivas, who was a veteran of the intelligence community himself, reminded me that one of the biggest challenges that faces the intelligence community is maintaining independence and integrity. Meaning in, in independence and integrity. So how much of the problem for analysts uh, flows from political pressures and policymakers who frankly have agendas and who have already made up their minds uh, to use intelligence, not necessarily in the way that it might be used to reach the best decisions. I'm thinking of Iraq, of course. Um, I, I had a personal experience uh, in 2000 briefing uh, President Clinton in anticipation of the Camp David summit. He asked, the invitation has already been issued. He asked those in the room to go around the room and give him their best assessment of whether he should go or not. Well, I was the last to speak and everybody else said basically the same thing, which was, yes, you have to go. When it came to me, instead of telling the president what he needed to hear, which was, you've already issued the invitations, you're going, but the odds of reaching an agreement in July of 2000 between Barack Arafat and yourself are slim to none, which is why we, ne we, ne we need to start preparing now for what to do when we don't reach the agreement. I mean, instead of saying that to him, I took a look at the late Sandy Berger and the late Madeleine Albright and concluded there and then that if I told the president he was going to fail, there might be one less seat at Camp David. And I rationalized that I might have an impact if I could go. If I wasn't there, I wouldn't. So that's a self-imposed political constraint, not one of my finer moments. But how do you manage, how do you, how do you manage to be honest and open and argue the case? when the people you're arguing uh, in front of uh, either don't want to hear it or have already made up their mind? Well, uh, <clears throat> John Brennan and I, John was uh, director of uh, Central Intelligence Agency, and, and, uh, and I ran into this a lot. And uh, we came to recall ourselves foxhole buddies, where <laughs> in the sit room, we were often the only two naysayers. And uh, uh, I think we drew strength from one another just because there were two of us there who could speak. Because, you know, the, what goes on in the Situation Room is just like any other room of people. And you do have group think and uh, group dynamics at play there. And what you have to try to do is uh, stick to your knitting as the intelligence officer Here's what the intelligence shows, or here's what it doesn't show. I'm reminded of the General Powell rule. You know, tell me what you know, tell me what you don't know, tell me what you think, and make sure you distinguish among the three. This is a good rule. <laughs> it uh, is. And fortunately, in my case, uh, I can't, uh, this is not a generalization with all presidents, but in my case with President Obama for the six and a half years I worked for him, and he was insistent and the first meeting I had with him, and we were complete strangers to one another. Uh, the first, he made it clear that he wanted, you know, the unvarnished best assessment of free of politics that we could give him. Now, there were others around him that didn't necessarily feel that way, but he did. Well, I mean, that makes a huge difference. Yeah. It made a huge difference for me made a difference in what I, I could, the top cover I could convey to the workforce, particularly the analysts in the, in the intelligence community across the board. 
when you don't have that, which was the case with, with President Trump, it's a lot more difficult. It really is. But I, it really wasn't uh, uh, an issue. And what, you, of course, you have to do is to safeguard to try to keep the politics out of the analysis as best you can. By law, the, intelligence, the, the Office of Director of National Intelligence includes an office whose full-time mission is analytic integrity mm. and uh, to, to monitor the state of health of uh, integrity in the analytic process across the entire intelligence community. And one of the tools, uh, very effective, by the way, are annual surveys of analysts. And this includes military intelligence analysts, the, those out at the unified uh, commands, to determine whether, in their view, politics were involved in uh, their generation, their preparation, their analysis of intelligence. And that in itself is a great safeguard to, to try to protect uh, analytic integrity. Now, yeah. in the end, the intelligence community is a large group of humans, of people, all of whom have their own internal prejudices and biases. And you, you can do what you can to uh, safeguard against that. And that's that that certainly is instilled in intelligence people when they first are brought into the intelligence community, but you have to be on, on guard for it. Yeah, important point. All right, let's move on to a kind of a lightning round of hotspots, um, just for your sort of instant takes. Okay, let's start with Ukraine. You know, intelligence is in prophecy. And while I, I think the Oracle at Delphi reading the best Godin trails would probably have a hard time divining where the arc of trajectory is going in Ukraine, but how do you how do you see it? I know you you mentioned to one interviewer that we could face a North South Korea situation, a divided polity. But where where do you see Russia and Ukraine going five months in? Well, I think it's a question of uh, who kind of blinks first. This does remind me of uh, the war in Korea from about 1951 to the to when the, fight, the shooting stopped in 19, July 1953. The basic battle line didn't change. In fact, the so-called demilitarized zone that now separates North and South Korea was pretty much the line of contact from the 1951 to July of 1953. And it kind of reminds me of, of that in Ukraine today. Uh, there, there are changes It looks like the Russians make uh, some modest gains, sort of one step forward, two step back, while the Ukrainians are extracting a lot of pain mm. on the Russians and, in my view, are exhausting the Russian military capability. So I think it's a question of, of course, Ukrainians have, have suffered a great deal of uh, casualties and, of course, as, as we've seen, destruction of their infrastructure. So the question is, you know, who's going to blink first? Who's going to be tired first and and go to the, the uh, negotiating table? I don't see prospect of that in the, in the near term. I think the Ukrainians feel, and I agree, if, if they're properly supplied, they can defeat the Russians. They can beat them. And we'll be doing all we can to help them. Right. Defeating, and I know you've changed your view on this. Um, defeating means what exactly? Well, defeat for me would be ex expelling the Russians from Ukrainian territory. That that would be defeating the Russians. Right. That's pre pre uh, February twenty fourth or pre pre Crimea. Pre Crimea pre twenty fourteen. Pre twenty fourteen. You know, Tolstoy said that patience and time were the were the greatest of warriors. Uh, <laughs> I guess it works both ways for Putin and Zelensky. North well, Korea, North Korea. You, you've you had a, a number of very personal experiences with this country. I think you were counted when you were chief of intelligence for U.S. forces in South Korea. You were in a helicopter flying over the DMZ and you took a round. Um, but that was a friendly round, it turned out. Um, yeah. 
and you had your 2014 mission, which resulted in, in um, the release of two Americans. North Korea is a nuclear weapon state. Whether we choose to recognize it or not, it's a reality. It's not Iran. Um, and uh, denuclearization seems to me to be um, a tough road. Um, I agree with you that talking to them in North Koreans is a lot better than talking about them. But how do you how do you see this unfolding? Well, um, th this is a radical view. But ever since my visit with uh, in Pyongyang and and my engagement with a couple of senior North Koreans right below the level of Kim Jong Un, <clears throat> I came away with the conclusion that the North Koreans are not going to denuclearize. They're just not going to do that. They understand that that is their ticket to survival. Uh, they brought up with me, you know, um, the fate of Omar Gaddafi, who negotiated away his weapons of mass destruction, and look how it turned out for him. The, parano the degree of paranoia and the siege mentality in Pyongyang was, blew me away. I, mm -hmm. uh, I'd always thought that's the way it was, but it's palpable when you're there. So I would suggest that people may, we might want to rethink our approach to North Korea. You know, a lot of people don't particularly like the fact that the likes of Pakistan and India have nuclear weapons. Well, the fact is they have them. And the fact is, they have behaved responsibly with those nuclear weapons, at least over the history of the time they possessed them. Well, maybe we need to think about North Korea in the same way and induce them to behave responsibly as a member of the nuclear club, which they already are de facto, right. if not de jure. Yeah. And our continued non-recognition of them as a nuclear power <laughs> doesn't change the fact that they are a nuclear power right? and need to be traded accordingly. The other comment I would make is that if there is ever to be a denuclearization, that it is going to emanate in Seoul, not in Washington, because it is Seoul that is going to have to make the North, North Koreans feel that they are not going to be attacked and that their, their government, the Kim family, is not going to be overthrown. I don't think the U.S. can persuade them of that. I think only the South Koreans can. It's a realist view, General Clapper, and I, I, I tend to agree with it. It, just, it collides, as many realist views do, with domestic politics um, and the capacity of presidents to to break the consensus. Uh, and it well, also the current, the current policies, you know, kind of reminds me of the definition of insanity. Well, right. uh, let's keep doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different outcome. And right. administrations, both Democrat and Republican, have stuck to this, you know, mantra that the North Koreans must denuclearize. Right. Well, they're not going to. I agree. OK, so a, a similar, although not not uh, necessarily strictly parallel situation exists um, with Iran. Um, President is. Wednesday is going to embark. Tuesday is, is leaving his trip. He's going to be in Israel. He'll see Mahmoud Abbas in Bethlehem. Then he'll go to Jeddah uh, to meet with the Saudis and uh, GCC plus the Egyptians, Iraqis, and the Jordanians. Iran will hover over this entire trip. It's a problem without a solution. You have a an agreement, which is highly flawed, but I would still argue functional as a way to manage the problem. We can't resolve the problem. We're, we're gonna, con unless you have a change in regime in Iran, and I think that's highly unlikely. So what, what, what are your views on a highly flawed, but, it, but perhaps still functional joint comprehensive plan of action, the Iran nuclear agreement? Is it the least worst thing that we can do to manage uh, Iran's nuclear uh, aspirations? Well, I was a big supporter of the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that uh, was negotiated during the Obama administration, specifically in 2015. And the reason I was a big fan of it was because of the unprecedented access that we had to the Iranian nuclear infrastructure in terms of surveillance and monitoring and, and, and all that. 
Well, that coupled with our considerable intelligence capabilities certainly gave me a, a, a pretty high level of confidence that we would know what the Iranians were doing. Well, I think there's too much water under the bridge. And I personally am not convinced, I don't believe that that deal can be salvaged. I think the Iranians um, for a long time wanted uh, to, re to, to restore the agreement and did things uh, in an effort to leverage or pressure the U.S. and the, well, P5 plus one, but the U.S. specifically uh, to come back to the table and, and uh, you know, reestablish the agreement. But I think they've done too many things that have uh, will be very difficult to undo mm. uh, that if you're, you know, if we're going to go back to the, the original 2015 agreement. So I, I'm of a mind now that uh, that's a lost cause and that if there is to be any agreement with Iran, it has to be on a much more comprehensive basis, which won't happen with the Iranians. Right. There was a deliberate, you know, a, a deliberate choice made by the Obama administration to pick the most daunting threat, which is the, the Iranian nuclear capability. Not that we ignored their nefarious activities in the region, you know, what the RGC was doing and their support to the likes of Hezbollah and Houthis, et cetera, et cetera. But we, the administration from a policy, made a policy judgment to focus specifically on the most fearsome threat, which was a nuclear one. Right. Well, I, 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 I personally wonder and personally think that there's just too much that water has gone under the under the bridge since then, and they're going to start over. Yeah, and that that leaves the looming prospect in the interim of increasing tensions between the Israelis and the Iranians, um, uh, and the prospects. Of, not to mention this. Not to mention the Saudis. Yeah. Right. Uh, a lot of rabbit holes there. All right, we're nearly at the end of our forty-five minutes. I wish we had more, <clears throat> but I want to ask you one question, and that is. Um, what what keeps you up at night? And more specifically, what is the greatest challenge, in your view, facing the this republic on July 11th, well, 2022? What, what keeps me awake at night, Aaron, is something I thought I would never worry about in the 50 or 60 years that I served, which is the, the internal situation in this country. Uh, I worry about that. I really do. I, I think the very our very democracy is is in jeopardy. The divisiveness and polarization in this country is is really really uh, dangerous. And uh, you know, I think the Rand Corporation very cleverly and aptly characterized a serious problem in this country, which is truth decay. Truth decay. We I have a well. bad. We have a bad case of truth decay, and when the, the members of a, democrat, a democratic society cannot agree on basic facts, on basic truth, we're in real trouble. And so I, I worry about that more than all the classic, you know, the Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and cyber and space and all that. With one exception, I, I, I do want to single out, and that is... Uh, all of this is not going to matter if the planet doesn't get its act together and take on climate change much more effectively than we have. Right. Uh, I just, a week ago, became a great grandparent. Congrats. And I, wa I wonder about what life is on this planet will be when my gr great granddaughter is my age. Uh, as a grandfather, I. Uh, first of all, congratulations. It's wonderful. As a grandfather, I think the same things. The headlines don't look great and the trend lines look worse. Sometimes I think we've seen the enemy uh, and the enemy is us. Yeah, it's Pogo. And that's, uh, we've, been through, we've been through a lot in 240 plus years, but we've never been quite here before. And what you say about truth decay is critical because if you can't get a consensus in a self-governing democracy, on basic facts, it leaves the door wide open for someone, somebody 
to write in and present or provide his or her conception and definition of what the truth is. And that is a, it's a pre-authoritarian prescription for continued democratic sliding. And it's, it's bad. Anyway, I don't want to end on a bad note. Um, I've learned a ton. I thank you for spending your precious time, your wisdom and experience. And I hope uh, for the, that you'll agree to come back at some point um, so we can do another assessment. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for having me. A great discussion. And uh, I can't believe how fast the time flew by. And I'd love to come back. All right. Terrific. Thanks so much. And Thanks, um, thank thank everybody, uh, Carnegie Connects listeners, for, um, for participating. Until next time, think positive and test negative.